It's October, so we're going to get a little spooky. Today's guest runs his very own haunted house. He takes that unique experience into his classroom by creating a one of a kind special effects class for his high school students. I can't wait to hear more about it, so I'm delighted to welcome Chris Screws to the podcast. This is Cindy Ingram, and welcome to the Art Class Curator Podcast, where we're taking art out of the dark with thoughtful explorations and in-depth interviews designed to ignite curiosity and delight in art classrooms everywhere. I am so excited to welcome Chris Screws to the podcast. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Well, you were recommended to me by Anna Nichols from Managing the Art Classroom, and she said you're doing some really cool work in your state, Alabama. Yes, correct. And she said you're running a program that's one of a kind in the whole state and that it's really exciting. So I am really excited to hear what you're up to. So can you just kind of give us a rundown of who you are and your experience and that sort of stuff? Well, I am currently a high school art teacher at Pinson Valley High School. It's just uh, northeast of Birmingham, Alabama. I've been teaching now for 16 years. Started teaching middle school art and did that for six. But then at Pinson, past 10. You want to go back further than that? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about your childhood. Well, I mean, what got you into teaching art in the first place? Probably my experience that I had when I was in middle school and high school. When I was in middle school, I had a phenomenal art teacher, Dr. Mary Kerr. She was fantastic and showed me what art could be. And then middle school, it was was a little more loose. It wasn't as structured. So a lot of, well, self-exploration, but not getting too deep in the weeds there in high school. Well, I love, it really does draw attention to the fact that we make the choices we make as teachers can impact a student's life. Like you're an art teacher because you had good art teachers. That's, I got an art history degree because I had one person in my high school that taught me art history and I fell in love with it. You know, if if I hadn't been there, who knows what I would have done, you know, that's awesome. So what are you doing now with a high school that is particularly unique? First of all, we also just have a regular art program. So I'm teaching art one, two, three, four, AP art. And then, but the very special thing that we have. Six classes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you teach six classes. All at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we are split up our art one is separate and art two is separate. Art three, okay. four, and AP are, are mixed in together because they're okay, got it. <laughs> but our special class that I, I teach is special effects. It's prosthetics and prop making and costume making, set design. So it's a little bit of mixture of theater in the art classroom. We still also have a phenomenal theater program and they have their own tech classes as well, but we specialize in the more artistic side of things. So what made you start doing that? Well, it's something that I've always liked. I've always enjoyed special effects, but I didn't really have a lot of exposure to it when growing up. Just it wasn't around. It might be a small, tiny picture in a magazine, maybe in Fangoria magazines. Like that's what a mold looks like for a mask. (laughs) So there's that. But beyond that, more recently, about 10 years ago, one of my buddies who's working at Pennsylvania Valley High School we're just chatting one day and talking about horror movies and, and stuff that we enjoy and Halloween. We enjoy that. And he said, you know, I used to work at a haunted house just about two miles down the road, but they're not having a haunted house this year. Would you want to consider possibly going in with me and, and starting that up? So I, I had never done anything like that. I mean, we decorated wow. our, our house before my wife and I had, but, <laughs> that, but not much. But I naively said, sure, let's, let's try it out. <laughs> Let's start a business. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> and, and it had become that eventually. Yeah. But yeah, he just proposed that. We had to meet with the city council and the it's at a community center two miles down the road where we have the haunted house now. But yeah, we had to meet. They did not want it, by the way. The people before <laughs> us, they just wrecked the building. They were not happy with how things were. So they were adamantly against it at first. But we, our, we did a, a big presentation proposal, used our PowerPoint teaching skills and showed what we could do. And we even proposed a storyline, which was different from the past, because a lot of haunted houses sometimes are very random. But mm-hmm. we wanted a story, we wanted a theme, and we stuck with that theme for now. This will this fall will be our eighth year. Wow. So that's how the special effects class started out of a community event. And then from that community event, a lot of our high school students were attending. They were going to the haunted house. They were enjoying that. Some of them, once they were 16 and older, they gave an audition to be in the haunted house. So they were interested in that aspect. And then the more involved we got the haunted house, the more opportunities we saw to, okay, there's, there's an artistic side of things that we're not fully taking advantage of. So I proposed to my principal at the time, Dr. Terrence Brown, could we have a class like this? And there's no syllabus for it. There's, it's, it's an <laughs> experimental thing. So luckily in Jefferson County, we have a visual arts elective. So we tried it out. And now this is the fourth year of our special effects class. 
it's grown leaps and bounds. It started out almost more as a glorified cosplay class. <laughs> and now it's, we're far more advanced in our makeups and our crop making and costumes. It's getting better and better. We started to attract attention from outside of the Birmingham area. This pat every year we always have a showcase. So our students have to develop characters, write narratives, just plan sets and costumes and makeups. And they work in small groups to put on a show very similar to if anyone's seen the TV show Face Off on Sci-Fi. Hmm. I haven't seen it. It's a reality TV show where artists compete. Oh, that's cool. So, so kind of like American Idol, but for artists. Is that streaming anywhere? It is on, I think the first 10 seasons are on Hulu, right? 10 now. seasons. Okay. I'm going to look that up and watch it because <laughs> that sounds really cool. It is. It's- so the kids create a whole scene in groups and then they face off. They, it's a competition. It, it is a competition. It's kind of like a fashion show, but with music and interesting lighting and the kids have to act out the narrative in character in front of a panel of judges. And then they're judged on various aspects of their makeup and their costume and their presentation, their narrative. So they do their own makeup and prosthetics or are they? Okay. Wow. Yeah. We start from scratch. We don't buy anything off the rack. Maybe a few costume pieces that are pre-made that we alter. So they make their own, but they do it on themselves rather than a model. Well, there are some groups that do themselves. And then there's some groups, they hire some of the kids from the theater class. Yeah, that's what I would do. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Is there like videos or pictures of this online anywhere that we can link to? Absolutely. We definitely have pictures on our Instagram page. Okay. We'll link to that in our show notes because- Absolutely. uh, Please. I wanted to check that out. That's really cool. Okay. So the kids create the sets and stuff for the haunted house? They assist with it. At this point, the students are involved with the makeups. In fact, they're my entire makeup crew at the haunted house. It's all made out of high school kids. We do have some kids that are graduating this year that are wanting to come back to still be part of the makeup crew. So we'll keep some alumni there, but yeah, they're responsible for the makeups entirely. They do work on some of the costume pieces that might need some more sculptural fabrication. If it's straight fabric, then we do have people on staff at Insanitarium that take care of of those costumes. And we also have people who work on the sets at Insanitarium. That's so cool. So Walk us through like how you run the class and what you do, okay. like the logistics of it. Well, the way our schedule is set up, most of our classes are semester based, except for this one. This one is we, we have it on the skinny block. So it's a 50 minute class that meets every day of the entire school year. So during the fall, we do a lot of project based lessons that are they're acquiring the skills they're going to need to then implement their characters in the spring. So, yeah, we work on like how do you sculpt a prosthetic? How do you mold a prosthetic? How do you run a prosthetic? So we do all that in class. We talk about a little bit of costuming, which is something that I'm personally, that is not my thing. So yeah. I luckily been able to make some friends around here in the Birmingham <laughs> area that are going to assist us with some costuming for next year. So I'm very excited about that because I'm going to get to learn some really cool things. Yeah. I imagine this is an entirely different skill set that you're kind of having to learn as you go while you teach it? Well, yes. Sometimes I am doing something for the first time the day before the kids are going to do it. Yeah. But as artists, we're problem solvers. So if you have a good skill set of drawing and painting and sculpting, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. And some of the kids get really nervous and think, I can't do this. I've never done it. Yeah. You're in school. You haven't done the majority (laughs) of what you're doing today. And you're like, I hadn't done it either until, you know, midnight last night. So (laughs) you're going to be fine. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So you study the skills of makeup and costuming and then they create the start. Yeah. So they acquire all these skills and then around, I would say around mid-October and November, we really start hammering down exactly what we're going to do for the showcase that year. Now we set a theme every year. So this past year was they had to take classic monsters. So a vampire, a werewolf, a mummy, and then they had to do their spin on that. So they started pairing up, or in some cases we had as many as four people in a group. They started developing storylines for their possible character. They had to present those. In fact, I told them that I did not want two of anything. I didn't want two vampires or two werewolves. So Mm -hmm. they had to write up their proposals and they had to make a presentation in front of the entire class. So I had executive decision on which character was going to go, but they also, by them seeing each other's work, they would realize, okay, Yeah, your vampire is way more interesting than mine. So I'm going to back (laughs) off that and I'm going to let you take that and I'll go somewhere else. I love that because it teaches them and it shows them, yeah, the possibilities and it inspires them to do their best work if they see before they get 
kind of new, too deep in it, that formative right. assessment piece. I love that. Yeah, at that point, at the beginning of the year, they don't even know how to do things. So they're <laughs> coming up with crazy ideas like, do you know how? No, I don't, but maybe we can figure it out. I love that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So they work on that. How long does it take to work on their... The showcase was April 13th this year. So from mid-October to April 13th is how long it took to develop and make their characters. Wow. It's a lot. (laughs) That is a, I think it's a really amazing way to teach kids how to focus and to like really see a project from start to finish because, and do they get bored with it or they just, they might, (laughs) they don't express that. (laughs) They do. I I think there are so many different aspects of the character. That's true. It's not just one project. It's one theme. There's a, Uh, as a unit, but there's a theme there. So there are different aspects. So they divide up. It's like, okay, I'm going to make this armor piece for this werewolf. And okay, I'm going to make the mask for this character. So they divide jobs up and then sometimes they hand them off to each other and throughout the process, but they're constantly working on something different. So not a lot of time to get bored. How do you grade that in that sort of team? Are you putting the time in because they don't know how to do something? It's hard for me to set timelines on a, so if you're going to make a mask for the first time, well, okay, you do you know how to even sculpt the mask? We can start there. And then if you know how to sculpt it, then do you know how to mold it? Do you know how to run it? So it's hard to set timelines in mm-hmm. my regular art classes, it's much easier because we can pretty much know how long it's going to take to do self-portrait. Yeah. We can gauge that, but it's tough. Just, to, so as long as they're working and they're actively yeah. trying, then they're going to be fine. Yeah. So it's more about the completion and the project and the, the grit and the perseverance to get through it, I think. Mm. Okay. This is really cool. I just want to like dying. I'm like, I, why did I not know that the Instagram existed? Because I want to look at all the pictures right now. So tell us, like, what are the showcase that just happened with the costumes? Up? Can you tell us about a couple of the projects that turned out really well? But first of all, I was incredibly proud of our kids this year. They took some chances and did some things that were incredibly extreme. I think part of the reason they were wanting to take things to the extreme is because some of our seniors, they had been with us now for three years in the class. And they really want to just go all out. And one child I'm incredibly proud of, his name is CJ. And he's one of our graduating seniors. Just had a conversation with him after school. He was cleaning out his workspace and Uh. decided to see him go. But he sculpted this amazing bat-like vampire cowl that the ears extended off the head, probably a good 10 inches. And and you'll see in some of the Instagram pictures, but it's a pretty large feat, especially for a high school kid. There are many effects artists that would probably not be willing to take a risk, but it's the process required a two-part mold, which anybody who's ever tried to mold anything of any consequence, a two-part mold is far more difficult than just a single part. Mm -hmm. So for him taking on that, that was a pretty awesome feat. And it was pretty impressive when it was on stage too. And then one of our winner, one of the kids in the group that won, just her craftsmanship was gorgeous. She developed a character that was a witch character. She learned how to apply a bald cap. So she applied a ball cap on her buddy from theater <laughs> class and she made these beautiful bone like prosthetics that went over the brow and, and over the forehead It blended in flawlessly to the bald cap. Just wow. her, her airbrush work was gorgeous. She even sculpted finger attachments that then she out of, and then molded them and ran them out of silicone and attached those to her fingertips. So she had an extra inch on the fingers that just made it look off. And from a distance, like this is creepy, but it wasn't (laughs) so extreme that it looked crazy. That's awesome. Wow. I love that freedom. They have to be creative and take risks. So you have kids that come back every year, take the same, the class over and over. Yes. Yes. Three years is the most I've had as a child in class. But a lot of kids, yeah, it's usually more than one year. Yeah. Does that put a lot of pressure on you to like create, make it new and different? Or is it just they're pushing themselves harder? They just push themselves harder. We just go further. So every year it's, we've just been upping the game. So what was before the amazing thing is now like, yeah, we got that. So move on to that. (laughs) So do you partner with the theater department at all to like on the shows that the theater department puts on or anything like that? That is in the works. We had a new theater teacher this past year. So I know he had some really solid plans that he knew he could take care of everything on his own. So he didn't really need us, which was, that was totally fine. But yeah, I think next year we'll definitely be quite a bit more involved. Yeah. It's just the idea of, you know, putting them together could be really powerful, I would think. Yeah. 
So what sort of artists or artworks do you look at as a class? Do you study other artists? For the special effects class, I assume. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Depending on what level the student is, we may talk about some more introductory level people there. We talk a lot about movies, but we also talk a lot about haunted houses Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of overlap there. Usually the haunted house work is a little less polished. So it's a nice entry point for a lot of our students. And if they want to take it to that film quality, then we start talking about different artists. So there's a gentleman named Alan Hops. He is a, in the haunted house industry, is a YouTube sensation. He's quite phenomenal. His channel is Stilt Beast Studios. And he is as much an educator as he is a businessman, if not more so. Great tutorials on how to do things on the cheap but also how to do things that look amazing. So we talked about Alan a good bit in class. There is a man named Todd DiBersini. He has literally written the book on special effects that he actually has volume three coming out this summer of special effects makeup. It's fantastic. So if there are any art educators out there who want to maybe get into special effects, look up Todd DiBersini's special effects. It's phenomenal. I imagine you need a ton of different types of supplies for this. Yes. (laughs) How do you manage all of that? Is that I mean, the budget? So each student has a fee of $40. That's for our more advanced level classes. That $40 in the special effects class might last the first nine weeks. So to supplement that, because of the haunted house, working with the community, and we have so many children volunteering their time to do makeup with us, and also in some of the cases act, we get a check from the haunted house every year. So that supplements our budget. Oh, that's awesome. So they're kind of getting to see that their work is paying off. Yeah. I wouldn't think $40 would go very far. No, no. The supplies (laughs) for special effects are quite expensive because we want to make sure that everything that we're using is completely safe. There's so many people out there and we have the conversation all the time with my students about YouTube is a really amazing and dangerous place because anyone can make a video and anyone can profess that they are a professional at this. So (laughs) We have to say, okay, you stay away from these YouTubers and then you follow these professionals and you're going to be totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. You, I love YouTube. YouTube, you can get any, learn how to do anything. You've been really bad things. So I guess that's bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's awesome. What movies do y'all look at for special effects? I prefer monster movies. I want something more fantastical because I, I don't like gory, like real gory stuff. Mm-hmm. I, it really disturbs me. I don't like the sight of blood at all. Even though I teach a special effects class, it's awful. I can't get my blood taken without passing out. Hmm. So what influenced me, movies like American Werewolf in London, that was the first movie, the transformation scene in that. Anyone's a fan of horror movies, that's a pretty seminal transformation and just effects makeup by a makeup artist, Rick Baker, who is just, he's the man, he's the guy. So people who've seen The Grinch with Jim Carrey, he did that. That's his stuff. Yeah, that's good. Wow. So I can imagine that you have really inspired your students to continue on this path. Do you have students who? Yes, just this year. Uh, So we have two seniors who are graduating. And it's actually the two that I mentioned previously about the creatures that they made. Uh, We have one student who's going to be starting in the fall. CJ will be starting a special effects school in Nashville, Tennessee called AMUA, Academy of Makeup Arts. And he will be starting as a student in the fall. And then that's amazing. uh, I have another student, Laura. She will be starting in the spring. That's her plan to go to Nashville as well. And it's a really cool school. We've made several visits up there just to check it out and meet the faculty. And Mm -hmm. it's a a small school, which I appreciate because they're going to get that individual attention. And it's not too far away from home. So (laughs) they can come home if they need to, or parents can rush there if there's some sort of emergency. So I like that because that's what I wanted to when I was in. Yeah, I love that because that's such a specialized field and too. So you would really want something that is, you know, like if you think about their future, what sort of impact you've made because you had the idea to start a haunted house. Now you have students who are going on to be like, do amazing things. Well, thank you. I did not have the idea. My buddy had the idea. (laughs) said yes. Sure. I have to admit, I hate haunted houses. Well, actually, I've never been to one because I can't even watch like suspenseful movies without freaking out like or TV shows. So I don't go to haunted houses because, okay. but <laughs> so I'm like, so Texas, not in right? this world at all. You live in Texas? Mm-hmm. Okay. So in Plano, Texas, there's a haunted house called Dark Hour. The director is Alan Hops, the guy I was talking about on the oh. YouTube channel. So if you reach out to Alan, he might be willing to say, yeah, come on, you can see the studio. You can see some of the things that we make and sculpt and so 
I would have reach to out go through to, it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't have to be scared. You could just enjoy the art aspect. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. That is a really good idea. I wonder, do those sort of places offer like school tour visits and stuff like that? For I don't know. I know that with our haunted house at the end of the season, we did offer behind the scenes tours in lieu of going through the haunt because there are people like, like yeah. you and my wife that do not enjoy nope. going through a haunted house. <laughs> but they can respect the artistic nature of things. That's great. I never would have thought you could do this in just a regular classroom. A regular art classroom is like in a careers unit or something to bring in somebody from one of the local haunted houses. I would have never thought of that as something to include. I don't know why I know it never would have thought of that. Do you have any recommendations for someone who might want to do something like this on a smaller scale, like as a part of, you know, a regular high school art class? Yeah, I know it's, there's a few materials that I would definitely encourage people to start with. There's a product called Monster Clay. Monster Clay is a wax-based clay that is completely recyclable. You can buy a five pound tub for about 30 bucks. And I've been using the same four tubs for now five years. Oh, okay. So it's, wow. it's great. So you can sculpt. So if it doesn't even have to be special effects, but if you wanted to sculpt little wound applications on a flat surface and then build up mold walls with foam core and hot glue, and then you can pour plaster of Paris in the mold for the mold and you can run prosthetics with a little bit of liquid latex, or even you can do glue and tissue paper. So you can do this incredibly cheap. Okay. But I do recommend that type of clay because it's wax based. You can even, after it gets dirty with clay or plaster, you can uh, heat it up in the microwave and you can skim off the debris and you're good to go. Okay. So they make the prosthetic piece or whatever they're mm-hmm. going to make out of this monster clay. Mm-hmm. Is that what you called it? Monster That's clay? That's the brand name, yes. Okay. We'll link to it in the show notes. And then what do you do from there right after that? So, so you make it out of the clay and then right. you... <laughs> you sculpt your piece on a, like say a small tile. So you okay. have a nice strong flat surface and then you can build up mold walls, side walls around your sculpture. Okay. And once you do that... And it's sealed and it's watertight. And I use hot glue just to seal it up. It's Mm -hmm. much easier. And then after you do that, then you can mix up your batch of plaster. Okay. And it can be any type of plaster. We don't use plaster Paris because it's fairly fragile. So we use HydraCal or UltraCal that has a good bit of basically cement in it. So Mm -hmm. it strength really well. But pour that in there, let it cure and pop it off. And now you have a negative of your sculpture. And then you can fill that negative with whatever prosthetic material you'd like to use. Got it. Okay. You, when you said it the first time, I was just hearing all these words. I was like, I don't, this isn't computing. Okay. I, I got I it. A few steps. It's you're, you're talking to someone who has very little background in creating sculpture. So that's not a, I guess I did take one 3d design class in college, but sculpture, I don't have just never been very good at sculpture. So, okay. So you're making the mold out of the monster clay and the, then the sculpt, the Paris, the sculpt and then you're, clay. Yeah, yes. Got it. Okay. Everybody listening will, that will make complete sense too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just they're, like, they're, I don't even know. Okay. All right. Oh, so that's fun. And so then silicone you use to create, and then do you paint it? You with- can. It depends on what you make your prosthetic out of. If you make your prosthetic out of something that is elastic, then you have to make special paint mixtures. So it becomes elastic as well because normal paints okay. will crack across an, an elastic surface. So if you make your prosthetic out of latex, which is a very traditional old school makeup product, then you have to take one part acrylic, high quality acrylics, one part latex and one part water and mix that together to make a really elastic paint that you can use on prosthetics. You can use it on latex mask, which I make lots of latex masks. That, that's my hobby and slash small business. Can you share with us, is that on the Instagram too, or do you have your own Instagram? Mainly Instagram, but you can also go to insanitariumhaunt.com and you can find some links, but I do promote some of that through Insanitarium. In fact, I'm going to be teaching a mask making class this summer in late June and it's June 28th, 29th, I believe. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I can't remember the dates exactly, but it's (laughs) at the end of the month of June. Oh, that'll be fun. That's really cool. Okay. So we'll link to all of that. This might air actually after that. I'm I'm not sure, but that's really neat. Okay. So to get started, you can do a small scale wound. You would recommend a wound? To start well, with, or if, if they want to do special effects, that's a pretty good place to start. Is just okay. a simple cut would be good. Okay, and so we'll link to any other resources that we have too. We'll find the products and we'll link to them in the show notes. If you're just really fascinated and want to try it out, even for yourself, I kind of want to just make one for myself and just see how I do. It's fun. You get to freak your yeah. friends out. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. I'm going to do it. 
Okay. Well, that's neat. So we'll link to a bunch of like the YouTube channels that you like, the artists, the products. So if anybody wants to check it out and link to an, your insanitariumhaunt.com. And so the last question that I always ask everybody as we're wrapping up is which artist or which artwork changed your life? Well, since we've been non-traditional art this whole way through, then I'll, I'll pick a couple of non-traditional artists. I don't know about a specific piece of art, but the artist Neil Adams, he is a comic artist. And I fell in love with art because of Batman. I wanted uh, to know how to draw Batman. So that's why I <laughs> wanted to learn how to draw. And that was it. That's all I wanted. Just Batman. <laughs> But Neil Adams, I don't know why, as a young kid, I gravitated to his work. It felt real. His anatomy is very accurate, but it was still Batman. But it felt real. It was more tangible, I suppose. Yeah, Neil Adams' work. And then in on into that, my young adulthood, with horror movies, we talked previously about Rick Baker's work in American Wolf in London was very important in developing my interest. So this the first transformation yeah. scene in that. So I'll see if I can find a YouTube video of that and put that it's, in the it's show It's pretty notes rough. Too. It, <laughs> I have to put in a warning on it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, if you show it to your students, it's not too bad. Maybe I won't want to watch it, but (laughs) a little bit of warning. I love how that when people answer this question, you can always see a connection with the types of things that they're teaching and things they're passionate about today, like to that artwork that they liked when they were a kid. You're looking at comic books and you're looking at storytelling. It's a very theatrical thing. And then you're doing this sort of theatrical thing now and they're totally connected. So yeah, it's my favorite question. I love that. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for everything you're doing for your students and for your community. It sounds amazing. And thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes. This will help other teachers find us and hear these amazing stories. Do you want even more art inspiration? Sign up for Art Class Curator's once a week email newsletter, your weekly art break. Teacher Sarah Warnock says, I truly do take a break from my busy week to check all your links and feel inspired. Everything you share is relevant, meaningful, and also super helpful. You definitely help me become a better art teacher, and I look forward to your emails each week. You can sign up at artclasscurator.com slash artbreak. And as a free gift for subscribing, you'll get six free art interpretation worksheets to use in your classroom. Be sure to tune in next week for more inspiring art interviews. Thanks again to Chris for sharing his creative work with us. I hope it inspired you to bring your unique skills to the classroom. Be sure to check out the show notes at artclasscurator.com slash 22 to learn more about Chris's work and everything we talked about today. Next week, I'm going solo to talk about travel. And as a bonus, I'll be joined by special guest Alex Thornley, who joined me in Europe for my first annual summer art trip this past summer. Keep listening to hear a preview of my conversation with Alex. And I did a really long unit on glass sculpture last year. All of my kids made Chihuly sculptures out of transparency paper and Sharpie. So I was really excited to see something that, I, that I'm passionate about, that I teach a lot about. I go to the Glass Center here in Pittsburgh pretty often to see demos and look at what people are making. So that was definitely a highlight to walk in in this new country, this new city, and see a, like a Chihuly. It's just like home.